I am pressing start on the timer. Bing. There Ooh. it goes. Yep. And how much time do we have on the timer? I have I have given us an hour and 45 minutes on the timer. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So now we're on the timer method. We are on the timer method. It's better than <laughs> I the calendar start method. I my own timer just so that I can make sure that right before the timer goes off, I can say something like, you know, and just remember the important thing, the only way to survive mm-hmm, is... Mm-hmm. Your life entirely depends on bing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we should, we should discuss the whole timery thing because, um, actually that's, that's going to be a large source of, um, control for this recording and all subsequent recordings. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, I thought it was just because you got tired of trying to figure out a way to outro each show. Well, I mean, that's part of it. I feel like, I feel like that's becoming more strained the more I, uh, the more I attempt it. (laughs) <laughs> so now there's just going to be a, this, this will just be ending whenever the noise happens. That means that the timer has run out <laughs> mid sentence, whatever. Doesn't matter. Just done. <laughs> done. No, no final round. No one last spin on the wheel. Right. Uh, but, the th- but the thing is we were seriously like, you know, the episodes were getting longer and longer. I mean, maybe not in the, in the outward facing portion, but in the internal facing portion of the recording session, we were we were swiftly approaching three three and a half hours worth of recording, and that's too much. Yeah, it, it was just it's it's a lot to fit into a busy schedule, right? And we both have designs on being busier with other things this year. That is correct. So, so. one of the things we're in instituting is a timer that says this is when you're done because we're terrible at stopping when we should. Right. Well, we're just just very interesting people. We have a lot of interest. We have a lot to say. <laughs> right. I'm just going to stop it. We have a lot to say. We do. We have we have tons of I don't know how things. interesting any of it is. Oh, it's massively interesting. Otherwise, why would we be doing this at this time in this fashion? Um, the yeah. other thing is you should answer a question for me. All right. Where the hell have we been? What? Um well, I was in New York. I don't know where you were. Uh huh. And <laughs> and and that was that was only supposed to be two weeks. <laughs> well, how long has it been since people heard my voice? Been more than two weeks. <laughs> Whatever. Well, oh yeah. Okay, wait. So I did. So my nephew for Christmas mm-hmm. got me and Ali strep throat and bronchitis. That was awesome of him. Yeah, he's a sweet little guy. For a two-year-old, he really, you know, he really cares. Very thoughtful. (laughs) (laughs) So we were supposed to record last week, but um, it would have just been me rasping and gurgling into a microphone. Oh. (laughs) Lovely. (laughs) That, that That was wonderful. Now I'm afraid to drink my tea. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that's that was what happened to the third week ah okay i guess we can forgive that we're gonna have to because there's no way to go back and undo it because <laughs> you can't go back in time that's right not yet well we're working on it <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know just before i actually accomplish it uh, well see i i know that i'm never going to invent a time machine yeah yeah, because I've written several notes to myself mm-hmm. um, that I still have plastered all over the place that when I do div- invent a time machine, I'm supposed to go back to specific dates. Oh. And since I have not already shown up with the time machine, mm-hmm. then uh, I'm fairly sure I'm never going to have one. But are, are, you, are you likely to actually follow your own instructions? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Fair yeah, enough. I think so. Unless, of course, I, I don't know. I mean... You know, I might discover that, you know, um, I don't know. I, I was going to try and come up with some sort of clever time travel plot, but I'm clevered out. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, more, no more clever for you. I was just thinking, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking had that whole standing invitation to any time travelers to come to his to his place at a certain date and time and have a party and whatnot. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, maybe, maybe nobody likes Stephen Hawking in the future. Right. <laughs> don't know hard to say 
And I am not going to make any of the punchlines that I just thought of because they uh-huh. would all be wildly inappropriate. There you go. And See? probably offensive. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, you know, the, the fact that nobody showed up does not prove that time travel does not exist. I mean, that is a very self-centered approach, Mr. Stephen Hawking, who is now deceased. Well, uh, <laughs> I I will say that, so, um, like, you, given certain models, of, like, if you take, like, a consistent history model of time travel, uh-huh. then currently, we are, if if there will ever be time travel and people will ever go back in time to change the future, then we are living in the result of those changes. Oh, you, you're taking, okay. you t- there's no way to change what's happened because what's happened is what happened because of the change. Well, more importantly than that, when, when, when you look, like, let's be honest, when we look at our lives, I, I mean, I don't know, this is not the life I would have chosen for myself if I had control over it. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I can conclude is that I had for myself set up an excellent life. And due to the activities of careless time travels for the future, mm-hmm. time travelers from the future, my life has now been changed so many times that I am now living a life that is not nearly the life that I envisioned for myself. And it is not my fault, um, which is why I'm now writing a self help book which is called Blame All of Your Problems on Careless Time Travelers from the Future. I like it. Yeah, it basically Sign says, me up for a copy. it's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up for a copy. <laughs> you know? so, somehow I have been prevented from achieving my dreams because it was the only way they could stop, like, super Hitler from dropping the atomic bomb on Washington, right. D.C. You're, you're essentially the <laughs> butterfly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fine. My life my life has to be crappy so other people's can be better. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's Yeah, that's I'm basically a, a friggin' time travel saint here. That's right. Speaking of which, did you ever play the there is a, a card game. As I guess it's a board game called Chrononauts. Uh yes. Oh. Yes, I have. Okay. I don't, I'm, I'm Moving thinking, on. I don't think I have all the expansions. Like there's like two different expansions or two different versions. I can't remember which now. Yeah. I, I think there's two. I know there were the Bush Gore years. Yeah. I don't have that. I just have the, I just have the basic one. The, the, you know, the starter kit. Yeah. But even with just the base game, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that, it is that very design, enjoyable. Designed by Andrew Looney of Looney Labs. Mm-hmm. It'll be in the show notes. I also have a, a game called, uh, let me see here. Oh, yeah. Kronos, K-H-R-O-N-O-S, which is interesting in that it plays across three different boards, and each board represents a different era. And, okay. and things done on the earliest board have effects on the other two boards, but things done on the most recent board um, sort of stand alone. Oh, okay. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I haven't actually actually ever had a chance to really play it. Huh. My my sadness is sad. It does look interesting. Uh, of course we meant to talk about time travel. That was that was in our notes. <laughs> well, actually, I was about to segue into talking about board games. Please do. Be- well, uh, because as mentioned, we we did miss some time because of the holidays. Mm-hmm. And over the holidays, I at least have the chance to play board games with people, and usually Santa is kind in giving me some board games. Hooray! So I got to experience two new board games. Tell me about them, please. Well, first, I finally got to, I finally got a copy and got to play Terraforming Mars. Oh, all right. Which is, which is one that a lot of people have been talking about that is very popular. hmm And I can see why. It's, it's a very... It's a very good game. It's very enjoyable. Um, it. I don't think it's like. No, you know what? I'm not even going to say that. Let me. I'll just give my flat out opinion. It's a fun game. Oh, good. Um, it is. It's a resource. Like you. Basically, each player is a future corporation. That is part of the 
that is basically managing some aspect of terraforming Mars, mm-hmm. to, you know, converting Mars into a more Earth-like environment. And as, although everybody is working together toward eventually pushing Mars into a into a terraformable state by having it have a proper temperature, proper atmosphere, and um, enough water coverage to create a climate. Um, and you do this by placing cities and vegetation and other tiles around the board and also engaging in projects. And although you're all working together, uh, everybody is earning victory points on their own. Mm. You, you know, so you so you, Mars needs to be terraformed, but you want to be the best person or the best corporation who did that, you know. And there's a lot of there's there's a lot of different strategies that you can utilize depending on the game. So you sort of naturally fall into a specialization as you're playing the game. Um, like I, I was mainly um, building steel electricity and then venting my, uh, I was raising the temperature basically by polluting the environment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the temperature had to come up. Sure. Okay? sure. I had a good way to do it. I, I was producing a lot of steel. So, <laughs> I mean, there's there's different ways to do different things, and each player sort of falls into a specialization. So the competition between the players isn't heavy, but there are enough ways to interact with each other that you're not just everybody's not just playing the game alone, mm-hmm. you know. And one of the neatest things about it, like when we started playing the game, okay, because the game plays until Mars has been terraformed. That is until you have hit um, certain milestones of temperature, oxygen level, and water coverage. Okay. And as we started playing, it starts out really slow. And I'm like, this game is going to take forever. And I thought it was going to be one of those endless board games. Because it doesn't have a turn counter. It's just until Mars is terrifying. Mm -hmm. But just naturally the game seems to accelerate as you play it. So although it's slow to start out while you're establishing yourself, everybody very quickly, just by the combination of cards they were dealt and different actions they took, they sort of, you sort of build into snowball effects where like suddenly I was cranking the temperature up by a huge degree and pushing the, to a huge degree. Ha ha ha. Or, and, um, you know, my, uh, Sean, no, not Sean. Um, who was it? Oh, Kim, Kim or, or tiny. It doesn't matter who nobody knows these people. Anyway, one of the other players was, had, um, started blowing open aquifers and, and letting water onto the surface. And as they did that, it, it kind of snowballed into creating more oxygen. And they had this sort of feedback loop going between their cards where they were generating oxygen and water and oxygen and water. And, so the the game actually very speedily moves toward a conclusion once you get moving, even if you don't know how to play the game, because we were we were playing it out of the box. We had never played it before. There were four of us. And the neatest part about it was it hit a point where I and at least one other player were actually looking at how to slow down the terraforming to eke out one or two more turns to earn victory points. Oh. So there's, there's actually a very good early phase, middle phase, late phase gameplay system. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of ways to reverse the way the game is going. So if you're behind, you are not stuck behind forever. Okay, because... Everything seems to be exponential. It's la- much later in the game when you start doing things, it snowballs. So suddenly someone who's behind can earn a huge amount of victory points very quickly and catch up. And But it still manages to play in a pretty reasonable amount of time, like an hour and a half, I guess. Okay. An hour to 90 minutes. So I was very impressed by it, even though when I started it out, I was kind of, um, I was a little doubtful of it, you know. There's a- and I was good. Sorry. There's a version of it on Steam. It, it's Oh, a, that's neat. It's apparently relatively terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. 
There's a, that's a that's a weird trend that's going on. But whatever, go ahead with what you were saying. Well, I, see, I felt bad because I caught myself. I was going to start this off by saying, you know, I, it's a good game and I enjoyed it, but I don't think it deserves all of the praise that it gets. Like everybody is talking about it, like the second coming of board game. Sure. But as I went through that review, I got myself thinking, you know what? Actually, it does deserve a lot of accolades. It is really well put together. It does everything a board game should do. A collaborative slash competitive board game. Our mutual acquaintance, uh, the one tar, uh, likes it quite a bit, mm -hmm. which is which is good. I don't, I don't, I haven't played it, so I don't know because I don't have friends that that play games with me or anything anymore. So it's just a box on a shelf, but it looks cool. <laughs> it looks cool. It's got nice art, apparently. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. All I can tell you about terraforming on mars is from board game geek so we'll link to that and you can look there and it's got an 8.4 well, rating which is good i will say this too it does have a solo play option oh it do do it yeah and it runs slightly differently oh. you basically as a solo player you have a limited amount of time to terraform the planet as much as you can mm. so basically you play basically you're playing it for points you have a certain number of turns um, to earn as many terraforming points as you can. Hmm. And I, I have yet to try the solo mode. How, how, much, how much would you call this the Settlers of Kamars? It's very different. Okay. I, it, it's not really comparable at all. Good. That's what I want to know. I, lo I love the Settlers of Catan, but I, I'm now a little bit wary of games that look similar to Catan and then turn out to be basically Catan. No, this, it looks similar only in that you have cardboard hexes that you place on the map. Oh, good. Okay. And that is the beginning and the end of the similarity. In fact, when I opened it up and I started setting out the pieces, my friend Kim, she looked at it and said, okay, how do you move the robber? Uh-huh. <laughs> because it, it does have that same look. Yeah. But it's, it's nothing like it. All it's right. a very, very different game. Awesome. I, mm-hmm. Oh, somebody's so, got so, I'm looking through the board game geek pictures and somebody has gone to the trouble of 3d modeling all the tiles. Wow. With, with okay. Various, you know, couldn't apparently we have, just have photographs? Apparently have rivers and you have little, little mountainy looking things and broccoli and I don't know what else. Yeah. The, well, you place the broccoli next to the rivers and the, <laughs> ah. <laughs> anyway, it looks cool. I'm not sure what the mountains could be. There were a couple of volcanoes that yeah. you can um, set off, basically. Oh, okay. Maybe that was it. It's hard to tell yeah, from the 3D modeling being, you know. Actually, that is a really, that is a really cool setup. Mm-hmm. But a lot of broccoli. Yeah. Well, the, the broccoli is important. It produces oxygen, and it's also good for you. Oh, okay. If you say, <laughs> if you say so. Uh, it's broccoli. In local news, yes. we lost our lighthouse the other day. Really? It just it just walked away? No, it blew over and fell into Lake Michigan. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's that's not how that's supposed to work. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually two lighthouses off the off the coast of Manitowoc. There is one historical lighthouse that is just there for show. And it's been there since, uh, you know, a hundred years or whatever. I don't know how long. Sure. And the other one was actually an active beacon. <laughs> and the active beacon, the one that was in use mm -hmm. uh, on, what was it? I guess January 7th. Um, it, the, um, oh, it was swept out by waves. Oh. So we had extremely high wind. And the South Pier Light Navigational Beacon. Um, was swept out to sea. Well, not to sea. To ocean, to lake. To, to lake. <laughs> to, to lake. It's claimed by Gichigumi. Wow. Um, oh, wait, no, Gichigumi was superior, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Gichigumi is Lake Superior. The oh, Which is the one that, that sunk the Edna Fitzgerald? The Edmund Fitzgerald? Ella Fitzgerald? Yes, Ella Fitzgerald sunk in Lake, <laughs> Lake Superior. <laughs> the, the wreck of the Ella Fitzgerald. I think, 
I think maybe we should turn to different topics now. <laughs> In other project news, um, let's see. They'll be hearing this. What day will they be hearing this? They will be hearing this on the 17th, which means one, two, three, four. They are merely... Which means tomorrow is my birthday. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, the 18th. Oh, well, happy, happy recording time birthday. Yep. Turning yeah. 29. Again. Again, again. Like my again. mother, strangely enough. <laughs> <laughs> my number one fan. <laughs> That's right. I, I, she's been at it longer than you, though. Um, <laughs> she's had a lot of 29s. A lot of 29s. A whole lot. The, uh, no, the, so this will be out on the, uh, this will be out on 17th, which means it will be one, two, three, four, five days away from the premiere episode of uh, Book Book which is the podcast that um, a number of people insisted must occur. And so you, you really are holding on to that title, huh? I am. Yep. And we're keeping it. Book, book. All the, all the, cause there's two books you see. Two books, yeah. book, a book, a book, 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 book. Yeah, no, I, I get the internal logic. Okay, good. I, I do. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Because it because it comes out on the twenty second of every month too, so that means it's book book on the two twos. Yep, it's about what I figured. The uh, it's interesting. We'll see how it goes. Once a oh, month. I wish I wish you the best of luck with it. Thanks. <laughs> also also means hey, you don't have to do any reading you don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure you'll agree is the key feature that you want out of this show. <laughs> Yeah, which it absolutely would have been nice if that was the way it was set up when I was involved. Yeah, well, you try things. Uh, uh, the minute you replaced me, you also came up with a way of making it much more manageable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know. But whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really have uh, much news beyond that. I've got a new chair, which was not not without its own set of problems. Dare I ask? Yeah, you can ask. I ordered it from Amazon. It showed up on time, so you know that's okay. That's great. But it did not show up with all the parts it was supposed to have. Or rather, it showed oh. up with fewer parts than it was supposed to have, and they were also the wrong parts. Huh. So that was fun. So even when they deliver to you, they can't get it right. Mm, I guess not. Huh. Anyway, I don't know. But that's that really my my holiday break was uh not terribly exciting. It was just, oh, it was just stuff and things and more stuff and things and then working on other stuff and things and now we're doing this. So there you go. That was me. Um can I ask you a thing? Sure. Why is the captain dead? Oh. Oh, getting back to the board games. That was the other board game I was going to bring up. Oh, okay. Um the the Captain is Dead is another board game that was purchased for me for Christmas by my cousin and best friend Ryan. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Ryan, who does not listen to the show. Of course, <laughs> I don't think anybody really listens to the show, but okay. Um, the Captain is Dead is a is a very fun little impossible to manage board game. It's it's sort of in the vein of like Arkham Horror and Pandemic, where you're you're gonna lose, but you're really trying hard not to. Okay. The idea is that each player is a member of the crew of a a spaceship, a starship. Uh, and the captain is dead at the start of the game. And the ship has encountered a number of unknown disasters that have damaged the ship um and left, like I said, just whoever Whoever happens to be al alive is now trying to run the ship. And ultimately, your goal is to just repair the warp core. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the non-copyright infringing oh. um, engine core. Uh, the jump core, they call it. Right, the jump core. Okay. R right, repair the jump core. Um, and if so, you can zip away from whatever is causing the disaster and get back to Starbase and be okay. Um, however, as the game plays out, disasters continue to happen to the ship in the form of broken systems and aliens teleporting onto the ship. Um, so you find yourself running around the ship trying to gather skills and tools 
to repair things as they go offline and ultimately to repair the warp core and each each character has a different position on the crew which gives them certain abilities and skills and of course if you have exactly the wrong combination of skills it makes it much harder to play mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. um yeah when tiny and i played it together just the two of us and i it, i ended up being i i think i was the sci- a science officer and she was a security officer and neither one of us were had any skill at repairing whatsoever right so it we very quickly lost control of the situation could not gather enough repair skills and tools in the game as things kept breaking around us and then we were just like basically putting out what fires we could and ultimately we lost and died in the cold bleak vacuum of space the end oh yeah okay so and the game the game um it escalates pretty quickly into disaster yeah but one of the one of the neat things about the game is that there's certain decks of cards that you are constantly drawing from you know like incoming disasters and um skills and tools and stuff and certain systems on the ship when they are in play they let you see the next few cards that are coming but when certain systems break like if your external sensors break you cannot see the next three turns worth of disasters coming you just flip them and deal with them blind mm. so it so that it's a neat mechanic that allows you to plan for what's going to break um you know what's going to break your ship next hmm. is is this this sounds a lot like red november it does sound a lot like red november a game i have never heard of oh okay basically, but i am now yeah. somebody just helped me provided helpfully provided a link to it yeah basically you're a bunch of gnomes in a sub and the sub is sinking and things are going bad rapidly mm-hmm. and 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 you know same basic premise. You try to fix it or stop things from happening, and 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 of course, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Yeah, it, it does look very similar. Hmm. Um, it looks a little less in depth though. Yeah. Ah, even though it's a submarine game. Uh, uh, yeah. You did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> Actually, I didn't. It just worked out that way. But I'm happy. Good. <laughs> Take any credit you um, can. <laughs> Anyway, I I do I can highly recommend the Captain is Dead though. It's cool. it, as long as um you can cope with games where you likely are not going to win, and depending on the initial setup of the game and what what classes you end up being, you are not going to win hard and fast. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's there's a lot of there's there's um, I. I feel like there's a number of games that are kind of in that same because what happened was pandemic came out, right? Right. And and then all of a sudden it was all about cooperative games where you were trying to prevent some sort of disaster. Right. And the disaster as the game goes on. Well, you know, it it was I think it really pandemic was the first game in that vein, wasn't it? Um kind of I can't think Yeah. But it, it's neat because by essentially what that game, what it provides is an opponent and a group based challenge, mm-hmm. you know, like um, it, before that in board games, if, you, you know, if you had, you could have competitive play where players would compete against each other or you would have cooperative play where players would simply be trying to, you know, there's a passive goal and you're just trying to accomplish that goal right so you're you're working toward it and constantly making progress what pandemic added was the fact a a feeling that the game is working actively against you right and that if you do nothing or make a mistake the game will get worse Mm -hmm. okay so a game where it's just about a team making progress it rewards good play but bad play is just bad play. It just doesn't make any progress. Right. And the best thing you might have is a timer where if you don't succeed by this turn, you've lost. But Pandemic was the first game that added, that added the capability of a board game to actively play against you. Right. It's, it's, I, 
I, I, and I'm going to end up being wrong because somebody will know better than I do, but I'm going to say it's, it was really the first fully cooperative game because prior to that you had things like Scotland Yard, right? which was, which was four, you know, four against one basically. So four people were cooperating to catch the, the other person and, and, um, corner them in a map and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, see, I, I can't say, like, I, I'm very wary about talking about um, developments in board games because I just don't have the, I don't have the same background and knowledge that I do in, say, role-playing games. Right. Where, you know, I, I'm pretty confident when I talk about role-playing games that I know what I'm talking about. Oh, and a you lot know? of, a lot of, mm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna recuse myself here almost immediately. Uh, a lot of um, war games also apparently are cooperative in nature. Really? Well, yeah, certain kinds. Um, like, there's always been a number of solo war game war games where where the you know for somebody who's just playing by themselves or whatever, mm-hmm. and then they play against you know the game itself with various charts and things and whatnot that uh, dictate the movements of the opponent pieces. Right. So there's always been that sort of thing. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Maybe I think my father played a lot of those. Yeah. Maybe. Um, maybe Pandemic was just the first one to do the fully cooperative thing well, and really, well, and really make the game a, a a huge challenge. Well, the other thing that we could say about Pandemic, and I feel more confident saying this, mm-hmm. um, is Pandemic did it mainstream. Yeah. You know, it was Pandemic was a commercially successful, you know, it was a popular game. It was not a niche game like war games are. Mm-hmm. You know, that may, and be, I think may be correct. Part of, part of that is probably because Pandemic is very approachable. It's not terribly complicated. No. At least from the get go. What complicates the game is as you keep playing the game, the, the game becomes more complicated. Right. Maybe it's all about Pandemic's curve. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I don't know. That would be interesting to look into, but guess what? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, understood. <laughs> anyway, so yes, okay, the captain is dead. Sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, another um, ang- angry recommends. Angry recommends. And a- a- also, I could say, if you're a Star Trek fan, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of references for you. Oh. Is that why? Is that why everybody looks color coded? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's there's the color coding thing is right in there, but like all the flavor text on the cards, mm-hmm. um, and just just the general feel of things too. Oh, cool. Like at one point, I realized we didn't have enough actions to to play the game between the two of us. Mm-hmm. We just we didn't have enough actions on a turn. So I was able to construct an upgrade. And this is exactly the sort of thing they would have done on Star Trek. I was able to basically pump epinephrine into the into the life support system so that we were all breathing epinephrine. Mm-hmm. And everybody got an extra action as a result. Cool. I wonder I wonder if this should have should be a like like if you were out there looking to to buy up, you know, a an IP or whatever, if this could be like Galaxy Quest the game. You know, it could it it does it could work that way. So I don't know if, if Galaxy Quest is exactly the... Is that is the exact, wrong vibe? You know, yeah. Honestly, if you took away the captain is dead aspect mm-hmm. and just allow for an incompetent captain, <laughs> <laughs> just, okay. just the captain is just as bad as everybody else, um, you could do like the Orville, the board game with this. Oh, cool. I, uh, I hear the Orville is, is starting a new season very soon. Uh, it's two episodes in. Oh, okay. See, I heard yeah. correctly. Yeah, I just, I, I, after we talked about it, I forgot about it mm-hmm. and stopped watching it. Um, so I recently restarted it. So now I'm working back through the first season. Cool. So I, I have, cause I, I can't, I can't go too long without having to rewatch a season from the beginning. So I, in the last week I have watched the first four episodes <laughs> okay. again. All right. <laughs> I only have one question left for you. Mm-hmm. You ready? Yeah. I'm going to make sure you're sitting down and you're properly bolted in. Uh, I am. I even have seatbelts. Okay. Excellent. Glad in to hear. In case the inertial dampeners fail. Got it. 
Yeah. <laughs> how 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 are your um your backers enjoying their copy of the book? Oh, you shut up. <laughs> 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 that good, huh? <laughs> oh my god. It's it doesn't stop. Okay, like well, okay. If this is going out on the 17th, no. See, I'm afraid to even say anything. Oh, okay. Okay. I am only going to speak as of what I know today the 11th. All right. Okay. I am not going to predict because I was going to say something very foolish. Mm. About what would what should have happened by the 17th. Uh-huh. Okay. So before I left for Christmas, there was a pallet of 1,500 pounds of books Mm -hmm. on a cargo ship somewhere between Los Angeles and China. I was waiting for it to dock, and I was waiting for the books to get offloaded from the cargo ship, which can actually take days. It can take days to unload a cargo ship, it turns out. And then on top of that, items have to clear get cleared by customs and that could take days um and then once they get cleared by customs they get tra- it was going to get transferred to a warehouse where i could then have a third party company pick up my books bring them to third act publishing in ohio where third act publishing would put them in individual envelopes and mail them to all the backers mm-hmm. now at this point i also have to say all of the signed copies for all of the people who backed it a hundred dollars or more. All of those signed copies have been sent out or in some cases, even hand delivered. Uh They are on their way to backers, but so get off the plane in New York. Uh, This was on what? uh, December 21st, get off the plane on New York, turn on my phone. Hmm. And I have a voicemail. I listen to the voicemail and it is a woman named Apple. Oh, which uh, that is how she introduced herself from the, from the warehouse telling me they had a pallet of books ready for me to take. And could I come and pick them up today? <laughs> I, I then explained to Apple that it was not my intention to personally pick up the books. <laughs> but I, you know, well, first I made the call. So right. now we're, we're in the car coming home from the airport and I'm already on the phone trying to coordinate this because if I leave them sitting in the warehouse, I'm going to get charged a storage fee. You know, warehouse space is not free. Right. So all the way home and then I get home and I'm trying to juggle this. And um, my partner and buddy, Jim McClure of Third Act Publishing, had found this shipping company. Um, and we got a quote from them and we arranged the shipping and everything should have been fine. And, you know, they were going to pick it up on the 26th. They couldn't pick it up before Christmas. So they were going to pick it up on the 26th, the day after Christmas. 26th comes. Um, that night, I get an email from them that they had to reschedule the pickup because they didn't have enough room in their truck. <laughs> I kid you not. This, is, this was the reason I was given. was the tr- They did not have enough room in the truck. Now, I did learn enough later on to understand how this actually happened. But right now, as far as I understand it, You hire a shipping company, and we had to give them the exact dimensions and weight of the pallet, okay, so so that they know how much space it takes up in the truck. Right. Okay. So, fine, whatever. They rescheduled the shipment for January 3rd. Okay. So, they couldn't make another swing past the warehouse for a week, and- They've got one truck, don't they? They have one truck. No, it's more interesting than that. Oh, okay. (laughs) Okay. The third comes, Uh and I get a notification from them that the pallet has been picked up. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yes. Meanwhile, I get a call from Apple at the warehouse Mm -hmm. that my pallet wasn't picked up. Uh, what now? Yeah, so now we have a, now we have a disagreement. (laughs) I love this And since Apple was actually... Looking directly at my pallet of books, ah, which had yes. my name on it, she was right. <laughs> <laughs> so then I called the shipping company and they confirmed that, sure enough, they did not pick up the pallet. Huh. What an interesting so, point to be confused about. <laughs> yes, they did not pick it up. 
And they did not also reschedule the pickup at that point. Oh, geez. So at this point, I, I, can't, I can't keep playing this game with this company. No. So that's the point. And last Friday, Friday the 4th, a week ago from today when we're recording, mm-hmm. that is when I put out the update that said, I'm not playing, with, playing these games anymore. I'm contacting another shipping company. And I'm getting the pallet shipped myself, you know, through someone else. Right. Okay. So ultimately I contacted the printer, Print Ninja, Mm -hmm. because they have a delivery service. Oh, do they? And yeah. And the reason we didn't go with their delivery service was to save a couple of bucks. That's worked out well. Well, you know, (laughs) obviously a couple of bucks is facetious. Right. More than a couple of bucks. Right. Because as it turns out, it is expensive to move 1,500 pounds of books is across it? the country. Yes. I'm surprised yes, at this Yes, on info. the order of 1500 to $2,000. Wow. That's like a buck a pound. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's even more expensive to move it across the Pacific Ocean, let me tell you. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we did it to save a couple of bucks, and that did not work out so well. So I contacted Print Ninja. They were able to get us on their back into their shipping program. Mm. They shipped the books you via UPS free. Ah, um, and they were picked up. UPS has I a lot of tracking. trucks. Yep, they were picked up. Um, they are, according to UPS, either being delivered to Third Act Publishing today or Monday. Ah, good. It just depends on how quickly they. They get moved from one truck to another. Cool. So at this point, the books are there or they will be there. Like they might actually be there already or they'll be there today or they'll be there on Monday. So when they're hearing this, this is all now in the past. The books arrived uh, theoretically on time where they were supposed to be and are going out. See, this is what I refuse to say. Uh huh. Okay. Because every time I have made a prediction that, okay, <laughs> nothing else can go wrong now. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't say that at all. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, it is, if you want the latest information on why you still don't have your book and you're listening to this next Thursday, the 17th, <laughs> go over to the Kickstarter page and see what hilarious update happens next. <laughs> In the meanwhile, if you're actually curious how this happened and how a shipping company could fail to pick up the shipment. Um, I can explain it in brief. Okay. Sure. Most companies, when they ship goods, they ship full trucks, right? right? Okay. You know, like, you know, when you, when you're in the, when you're doing freight shipping, okay, you have a lot of freight, freight to ship and you wait until you have at l- near a full truck. That's the most efficient way to do it. Because unlike packages where you can have a truck drive around to different places and drop off a package here and a package there, when it comes to pallets of freight, that is less efficient and less convenient. So if you need shipping and you only have, say, one pallet, then they call that LFL shipping. It means less than full load. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough to fill a truck. And there are companies that specialize in doing this. But they are expensive because it is a highly efficient way to inefficient way to move cargo around. Right. You know, so you pay for that. Okay. However, companies that do LFL shipping, like airlines, Mm -hmm. often have space in their trucks. Right. They, They just they end up with just not quite a full truck. Okay. So these other companies have sprung up called shipping brokers. And like Travelocity, what (laughs) they do is they look for space on a truck and sell it to you at a highly discounted rate. Okay. But like Travelocity, a lot less is certain. So for example, there is always the chance if you have booked a flight via Travelocity, that when you get to the airport, your seat's not there. Mm Mm-hmm. And they are not responsible. Or, in the case of a shipping broker, it is possible that if the shipping company um, ends up overbooked, there's not enough space on the truck for your pallet. And then they will reschedule the shipment the next time they can find space. And if you get unlucky, 
It's pr- pr- and probably around the holidays is the worst time to ship anything. But if you get unlucky, you can end up not having space on the truck several times in a row. Hmm. Now, Jim has used this broker in the past and has had no problems at all. So I can't fault him for recommending it. But given the amount of money we actually would have saved, which I now, by the way, have not saved. Right. Um, because it turns out, like Travelocity, if you cancel, they're not going to refund you everything. Uh-huh. Yeah, so um, I have gotten some of my money back from the first shipper. Had to pay, you know, the, the like $1,500 for the other shipping. And there's a certain amount of money that has now just been flushed down the toilet. So, in addition to not saving money, we have spent more to move this cargo. But, you know, that's business. And, again, you know, just to reassure anybody who's listening, we planned the Kickstarter well enough that having to spend a few extra hundred dollars on shipping did not destroy the project. Okay, everything's still fine. And I also did not go bankrupt or anything. Oh, good. Okay, we're not like on, and everybody has been paid for their work. Indeed, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's there's no financial issues other than um, the fact that it cost me more money than I wanted it to. But in the end, that is that is what happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> and had I known this information about the fact that I was hiring a broker and not a carrier. I probably would not have gone with it. I would have instead said it's not worth the potential savings, especially given the amount of money that we were going to save. Right. Yeah, I hate it. It was a $90,000 Kickstarter. So, you know, even saving $1,000 is, you know, that's 1%. Right. That's really not, uh, you know, it's, it sounds weird. I've never been in this position um, with my own money, or at least with my own company's money, where I can casually say, you know what, saving a thousand dollars just isn't worth it on this project. You know, it's not worth the headache. I have told other people that when I was an accountant, I was saying things like, "Look, you're talking about saving five thousand dollars on a project that's going to make you two hundred thousand dollars." Okay, stop <laughs> chasing the pennies. It's not worth it because <laughs> it's easy when it's someone else's five thousand dollars. <laughs> It's like, look, just spend the extra 5000 bucks. It's $10,000. What do you care? Who cares? It's ten. I have never been in a... It sounds really alien to me to say something like, you know, saving 1000 bucks just wouldn't have been a big deal. And how are you enjoying your executive yacht? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. I take it in the bathtub every night when I get cleaned up. And, and you know, I have a little captain's hat to wear when I'm playing with it. <laughs> and I put a little Lego figure on it. Nice. Pretend that's me riding it around the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. So speaking of, are you ready to publish uh, Transit yet? Uh, uh, well, I can give you a hand. When I was, well, see, I was thinking to myself, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll just turn the manuscript over to Angry and uh, Angry Games can handle all the publishing from there on out and I <laughs> and I will just sit back and relax. Well, truth be told, <laughs> here's the thing. A lot of the things that happened in this Kickstarter are mistakes I will never make again. Uh-huh. Okay? Like saving money on shipping, not worth it. Your shipping costs what it costs, mm. budget for it. Okay, I have learned that. Right. <laughs> saving money on layout, <laughs> saving money anywhere. Not worth it. Honestly, <laughs> basically spend the money you're supposed to spend and don't try to cut a corner. Yeah. Well, you know, I wasn't, there are, obviously there are places where you can cut costs. Mm-hmm. Okay. In anything, there are places where you can cut costs and there are places where it is dangerous to cut costs and involve risks and every industry and every type of project and everything has its own little foibles about what is safe to cut costs and where you're taking huge risks. Okay, so what I have learned now is when it comes to publishing a book, these are the places where it is not safe to cut costs. Mm -hmm. You know, 
find other ways to cut your costs. Like if I wanted to cut one of the ways I did cut costs was on page count because, you know, you know, originally someone tried to hand me a 280 page book and tell me, Hey, I, I've laid out your book, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, your 60,000 word book is 280 pages. And then I looked at how much it would cost to publish that and said, uh, we're going to shrink that right down, (laughs) you know? You know, and and obviously we made decisions about the paper quality and the and what paper to use and what cover to use and stuff like that. And those are cost driven decisions. Mm-hmm. But when it came to saving a bunch of money on shipping, um, and probably I should have been more suspicious of the amount of the discount I was getting and what I was getting for that discount. Because if you get, you know, if if someone quotes your price. And then you check it and, you know, a few other people quote the same price and then someone else offers you like half the price. Yeah. There's something going on with that half the price person. And that was a case where I was getting the travelocity of shipping and did not realize it. Now I understand that. Now I know about how freight shipping works. Now I know about how international shipping works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So. So, I mean, and that was the point. It was supposed to be a learning, learning, um, learning experience. Yes. So you so that the next project. time I publish a book, I can have completely different problems. Right. Right. We yeah. learn for our mistakes from our mistakes. So we can either repeat them exactly or make completely new ones. Right. That, that is my motto is never make the same mistake twice. Right. Screw up a completely different way every time. Keep it original and interesting. Well, I'm I'm glad your books are theoretically nearing their destination and soon to be in your supporters' hands. Here's hoping. I've enjoyed my copy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, apart from people who live under the same roof as me, you were the first person to receive books, I believe. Ooh, I feel special. <laughs> I know your number one fan enjoyed hers. That was good. (laughs) Nathan wrote in in the comments for episode 59 to point out that um, the Lego games are made by Traveler's Tales and that they often get confused with Telltale games because stupidly their logo is similar and they both shortened TT. Um, Telltale having gone out of business, this is important information for people seeking future Lego games. Uh, so Travelers is still very alive and will likely make <laughs> Lego games well into the 31st century, says Nathan. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That was our feedback. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell yeah. you something. There's a point in, in a, a, a Lego game, such as, for example, Lego Marvel superheroes, the first one. Mm-hmm. Where you get downright tired of trying to collect all the figures. Yeah. 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 And then all the, all not, not just all the figures, mm-hmm. but all the variations all the, on the figures. Right. Plus all the vehicles and the variations right. on the vehicles. Plus all the little gold bricks. Plus right. all the little red bricks. Plus all the little rescue Stan Lee's. Plus all the, it, there's just too much. So, uh, <laughs> on that vein... Yes, sir? <laughs> can I mention briefly Breath of the Wild? Oh, yes, you may indeed I, mention it. I will, I will come back and have more to say on this game in another week, because we've been babbling for a long time now. But, um, over Christmas, uh, Santa brought for Tiny and I a Nintendo Switch. Oh, that was nice of Santa. It, yeah, it's actually a gift that we agreed that we would purchase for ourselves together rather than something I would buy for her or she would buy for me. Right. We talked about it. We both wanted it. And I, of course, wanted uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Of course. Okay. Um, And I will have a lot more to say about this game at some future point. I have been very addicted to it. I okay. am enjoying it immensely. Good. But on the subject of collectibles, sir. Uh-huh. It is a gigantic open world. Okay. Unlike previous Legend of Zelda games, it has no structure to it. It is just a big old map with stuff to do. Okay. And most of that stuff is collectibles. 
And the, there's two particular collectibles of importance. The first one, the primary way you level up is you find these little shrines hidden throughout the world. And each shrine is like a little miniature dungeon challenge. Fight a, fight a boss or uh, uh, solve a, a, you know, one to three puzzles in a row on a similar theme or whatever. Get to the end and you earn a, basically uh, an orb that is the equivalent of experience points in the game. Okay? Okay. The other thing is that um, if you are attentive to your environment, you will notice odd things that are out of place. Like, uh, you might notice a ring of stones, like a fairy ring, except that there's a stone missing. Okay. And so you might cleverly decide, oh, there's a rock over there. I will complete it and see what happens. Okay. And what will happen invariably in these places is that a little forest spirit will appear called a Korok, and he will give you a magic seed. And you can trade these magic seeds for equipment upgrades. Uh, I think specifically it's like inventory upgrades, like the mm-hmm. amount you can carry, which is very important. Okay. Sure. And then, you know, you might notice that there's one tree standing on a hill all by itself. And if you climb that tree, there's a forest spirit hidden in it, whatever. So if you're just paying attention to your environment, they do kind of stand out. You know, you know what I mean? Sure. It's like, hey, what's, what's that oddity there? You know, or there's there's two little statues and they have offering bowls in front of them and one has an apple in it and the other statue is sad and has nothing. Oh. Yeah. You know, so if you take the apple away from the other one so they're both sad, then <laughs> <laughs> that that doesn't work. It, tur- oh, it turns darn. out. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Would you care to hazard a guess how many of these seeds and little forest spirits are hidden throughout this map? 10 million. Two. Okay, I understand. <laughs> there are 900. Oh, wow. <laughs> I looked at, because I'm finding them pretty frequently. Like, you start off the game, and it's fun. It's like, oh, there's an odd tree standing on that hill all by myself. I'll go mm-hmm. check. That. Oh, there's a fire spirit. Great. And then you get this little, it just rewards you for, like, checking stuff out. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, that's neat. That's, what's this oddity here? And there's all sorts of different ways they're hidden, and it's all neat. It's like a ring of lilies in a in a pool, and if you dive right into the middle of the ring of lilies, a forest spirit appears, and I was hiding here. You know, and some of them can, are only visible at night, and they float around and stuff. So I'm like, okay, I've found almost a hundred of these things, and I've covered like a quarter of the map. And not even thoroughly. Mm. Like, I, you know, you expose the map as you play. Sure. So I've exposed about a quarter of the map, and I've found about a hundred of these stupid, stupid things. So how many could there possibly be? So I looked it up. There's 900. Wow. That, that's a lot. That is absurd. There's also 120 of those hidden shrines in this map. 120 hidden shrines? Wow. Yeah, those, those dungeons that level you up. Mm-hmm. There's 120 of them. I normally don't look stuff up about the game that I'm playing. Because I like to experience it fresh. But I was really curious just how much stuff there is in this game. I also have this terrible feeling I'm never going to finish Breath of the Wild. And it's going to be one of those games that I'm going to play and enjoy for a long time. But not actually finish in any way. And I don't even mean 100% complete. I mean, you know, you know there's, there's Ganon in the middle yeah. of the map and you have to go kill him. And most of the game just seems to be about... Gathering all the stuff you need to be able to defeat Ganon. Leveling up enough, getting the super equipment, and freeing the four champion spirits. And um, I found a robot elephant that is going to help me. A giant robot juggernaut elephant made by an ancient race 10,000 years ago. Oh, that's handy. Yeah. Yeah, and it's currently firing a laser into, into Ganon's face. Oh, good. It just and it's just keeping that laser going <laughs> until until I'm ready to go fight Super Ganon or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, but I have this feeling I'm never actually gonna end up confronting or beating Ganon. I think my interest in the game is gonna peter out long before that. Fair enough. But in the meanwhile, I will probably be talking about it for the next two weeks straight. Okay, that's that's so nine hundred. <laughs> that's nine hundred. Yeah. 900. I don't even know how many little collectible thingies there are in the Marvel game. I just know that I'm tired of collecting them. Which, of course, gives me no no impetus to go play Lego Marvel Superheroes 2. <laughs> <laughs> 
which my brother assures me is a far worse game than the first one. All righty. Uh, we promised at some point in the, in the far distant past that we were going to talk a little bit about um, setting. I don't Why are we doing this again? Setting priorities for projects. What, what possessed us to think we could do this? I, I don't know. Once ag- once again, we are not life coaches. We are not. I don't know. People just keep coming to us and asking us to be. Uh, it's weird. It's not. It's I. This is the last time we're doing anything about any of this stuff, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, and then we then we could get back to discussing the gaming community, <sighs> <laughs> and and all the stuff we were discussing about community and the reality of the gaming community. Right. So there's that to look forward to. And by then I'll have finished Dennis Prager's Rational Bible and we can discuss ethical ethical philosophy in Judeo-Christian nations. In our gaming podcast. I can hardly wait. <laughs> hardly wait. So how do, how do we set priorities for projects? Well, um, it seems obvious, doesn't it? You just do the most important thing first. Mm. Right? Right? Mm. That not the way it works? <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, if you're if you're anything like me, all the things seem to be all important all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's why that method never works. Right. If everything's an A priority, you have not set priorities. That is correct. You have you have merely Lumped everything into the same bowl and are now stirring them about. Having looked ahead to what you wrote down as the notes, yes. I need to ask a question to provide oh. some context before we go into it. Okay. Okay. Are we talking about prioritizing different projects or things within a single project? Mm, that's an excellent question, sir. Or are we talking about prioritizing tasks, which I, which I would argue is different from a project? Right. Well, these are good questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Uh-huh. Because this, this I think, is, is more like prioritizing tasks. Okay. Things that need to be done. Although in several cases, these tasks could be in and of themselves projects. Right. Well, the the reason I ask is because I believe we had a conversation about goal set. Yes, we did. Right. And and one of the things we talked about was was our favorite topic of setting smart goals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, among the other things we pointed out there, it was the importance of when you set a goal mm-hmm. is you kind of want to tackle one goal at a time. Right. And this this priority setting thing, I guess it could be used to choose which of your goals is the one to tackle right. first. But it doesn't quite fit into that same framework. No, it doesn't. If you it, know it, what I mean. It's it's see here's the here's where <laughs> here's where smart falls down. Okay. Yeah. Smart falls down in that it is really designed to be a a single goal at a single time. Right. Okay. Or even like a single project at, a, at, at once, you know, you not you don't have a plate full of choices in front of you. Right. But smart also does point out, particularly if you go to, to books like, uh, what was it? Think small, mm-hmm. you know, which, which had a, which talked a lot about smart goals among other things. But um, one of the things they pointed out there was you are at your best when you are pursuing one goal at a time. Right. So the key is you identify one goal. You know, you identify the goals that you want, and then you pick the one that is actually the, the goal to pursue right now at this juncture. And you pursue it with the idea that once you get that done, you know, in two weeks or a month or whatever it is, well, then you can move on to another goal. You know, the idea of working on multiple projects is it's, I, I feel it's a trap that people fall into mm-hmm. because I, I, look, um, I, I know I can say this safely to you. 
but I know that some people are going to lose their minds when they hear me say it. People cannot multitask. No, they cannot. Okay. There are people who claim to be good multitaskers. And what, what they are saying is, I am really good at moving back and forth between this thing and this thing, or between three different things. But you cannot focus on two different things. And even if you think you are a good multitasker, you are better at not multitasking, okay? And, and so it is almost always to your benefit to focus on a single goal to the exclusion of other goals. Yeah. And, and so <clears throat> where we end up is um, we've done things backwards, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the discussion about smart should have been the second discussion we had. <laughs> Ahead of the one we're about to have. Which is about how to choose your goal. Yes. Well, the, re the reason I ask is because um, I, th I think actually the system you have outlined here, mm -hmm. that I realize we're still establishing context for, right. is a worthwhile system and very useful because although you should have one goal, one project that you are working for, life often frequently requires you to do all sorts of other things too. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, you know, for the last six months of my life, my project has been publishing a book, right? That was my goal. I did not try to have other major goals at the same time. Right. I, I was smart enough not to, and I'm also going to write this thing, you know, or I'm not, I'm not going to develop this, this role-playing game system or whatever. I'm just publishing a book. That was my goal. Mm -hmm. But in the meanwhile, I also have day-to-day -day work. You know, I have, to, I have to write articles every week, sort of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to write scripts every week, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm running a business. I have to, there's certain paperwork that I have to file on a monthly basis and on a quarterly basis. You know, and there's, there's certain accounting I have to do for my Patreon and this and that and the other thing. So, you know, I have all these little tasks that also have to be done, you know, and then in addition to that, I still have to pursue the big goal. And then of course you have general stuff too. Like, you, you know, you have to maintain a household. You might, um, you, you know, you, you have to vacuum or do laundry or you have to see the doctor or do other stuff. None of which counts as a goal. It's more sort of the survival stuff. Right. And so in any given week, you may find yourself juggling between a bunch of tasks. And in addition on that list, there is going to be a piece of some larger goal. This is the week I have to finish the first draft of my book or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? So in that sense, I think what the system that you're going to talk about is very useful and prioritizing the pile of all the things that need right. to be done. I don't think it's the way to choose between goals. No, no. And I think that maybe if people are interested, and I know this is death to even say this, because people are going to be interested and we're going to have to, that we should have a discussion about choosing goals. You know, when there's, say, six different projects you can work on, with the assumption that, you want to be working on one big project at a time, one goal, mm -hmm. whether it be lose 50 pounds or publish a role playing game or whatever it is. Well, look, if we're being honest here, OK, mm -hmm. we don't need to do how to how to set priorities for projects and things. We don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, which project is the most important already. You've you've sort of decided that or which task is the most important. And which is the least important. And you, and you kind of have already in your head prioritized those things, right? For example, vacuuming is not the same as going to your doctor. No. Okay. You know going to your doctor is the more important of the two. But as you point out, importance is not the only criteria. No, it's, it's not. It is not the only. But in, in a given... If, I, if I'm having a dinner party or uh, I'm having a group of people, I'm speaking literally about my life now. Uh -huh. Tomorrow night, I am having a group of people over to my apartment to play a role-playing game. My apartment needs to be clean before they come over. Sure. Because I like 
I like to, I like people to come into a presentable environment. Um, that is more important than, or at this juncture because of the time involved, right? That is more important than I need to schedule a physical, you know, my three month physical with my doc. Sure. Right. Sure. But if you, if you were to wake up this morning and go, Oh, I, I have a doctor's appointment today. I have people coming over tomorrow. And so I need to vacuum and I need to tidy up and all your doctor's appointment is still the most important thing you need to do today. Well, yes. Okay. Understood. All right. So that's what I'm getting at is you kind of in your own head already have things prioritized. You, mm -hmm. you know that certain things, uh, are, are more urgent and, and more present and whatnot than other things already. You have an idea for it. May not be a perfect idea. You may have trouble deciding whether you need to go to the laundromat first or go to the grocery store first. Maybe. I don't know. It's up to you. But, right. but you know that those things are not as important as I have a doctor's appointment, I have to pay my taxes, or whatever the thing is for the day. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. That's what I'm getting at. So a lot of people already have things sort of in categories of, of priority. They know certain things in a given day are more urgent than certain other things, or they've, or they've alternately also already had the priority set for them. Your boss comes to you and says, I need this by end of day. Right. Unless you're your own boss. Unless you're your own boss. Okay. Even, <laughs> even, <adds> a... <laughs> even then you should still be able to say to yourself, I need this by end of day. <laughs> Right. But now as my own boss, how did I decide that that mm -hmm. was, that was the priority? Right. And this is where we're going. Right. Okay. There are two things you consider, but there are four points of consideration when it comes right. to setting a priority. All right. Just through the magic of combinatorics. Through the magic of combinatorics. <laughs> yes. And, and they're broken down into two spectrums. There are two spectrums. Okay. okay? So we're going to call this, this priority thing the four D's. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I would say up front that the, the four D's are do decide, delegate and discard. All right. <laughs> These are the four. I, I like that you had to add a parenthetical after decide because yeah, cause it decide de didn't make sense, no. but you needed a D word. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. These are four bins that you're going to put things into. All right. You have a do bin, a decide bin, a delegate bin, and a discard bin. And I will explain those more thoroughly here in a minute. Mm -hmm. The way you decide what goes into which bin is by deciding where on the importance and urgency scale it falls and where on the high and low scale it falls. Okay. Now, the high and low apply to importance and urgency. For example, if you have a high importance task with high urgency, okay, so it's very important and it's very urgent, that's the thing you do first. And everything you have that is a high importance, high urgency task goes into your do box. That's right. It goes into the do box or bin or whatever you'd like to call it. All right. That works. Fair enough. I'm with you. If you have a high importance task with low urgency, in other words, it doesn't need to be done right away. Maybe it doesn't even need to be done today. It could be done tomorrow or whatever. That is a thing about which you will decide and decide is essentially you're going to put it on your calendar and schedule it. Right. Okay. So, uh, maybe the quarterly reports, they aren't due today, but they are important. They're, they're probably due at the end of the quarter. Yes. End of the quarter. <laughs> they're due at the end of the quarter. They're, they're important to do, but they're not, you know, I don't need it right now. So that's low urgency, high importance that goes on your schedule. You put that down three, four weeks from now and go quarterly reports. Right. The, the assumption being, of course, that some just that something is low urgency today, mm -hmm. but very few things remain low urgency Correct. forever. There is always a point at which something becomes either a disaster or moot, mm -hmm. which is which is what urgency really refers to is when does this become a moot point? Right. When does it stop mattering whether I've done it or not? Exactly. Uh, your next bin is delegate. The things you're going to put in the delegate bin are things that are low importance, but high urgency. It needs to be done right now, but it doesn't necessarily need to be done by me. Like collate all these papers. <laughs> okay. That's, that's low importance. If you have a staff, 
is the problem where we run into here with delegate. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to bring up that point. It's yeah. like, um, who are, in my situation, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do have these low importance, high urgency things. But, um, but you, you could, okay, so but you could theoretically ask Tiny to help you out with that, right? Well, and, sure. And and in theory, <laughs> in theory, the the successful completion of that task is not contingent upon your direct input. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it is something that needs to be done. So sort out these sort out these magic cards for me, would you please? <laughs> but what if it's something I like doing? I mean, that's fine. Then do it. I don't want to delegate sorting the magic cards. I love sorting magic yes. cards. But the low importance, high urgency things go into the delegate box. You find or try to find within, you know, whatever your means are, someone to hand that to and say, here, I need this done. You know, but I need Basically, it's things you 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 don't want to stop focusing on the on the stuff you're doing right now. You don't want to stop focusing on that to get those done, but those need to get done, you know. So the fourth D is discard. Those are for things that are low importance and low urgency. In other words, they don't actually matter to whatever it is you're doing right now. So you discard them. They go in the discard bin. You throw them away. They're not worth the bother and the hassle of trying to deal with those right now as well. Mm-hmm. All right. So there they go. It's that's the whole thing. You decide how important a thing is. You decide how urgent it is. All right. So you get high importance, you get low importance, you get high urgency, you get low urgency. And then your combination of those things decides what bin they go into the do decide delegate or discard bin. And, and that is how you work your way through a number of different projects or a number of different steps in a project. Okay. I like it, but yes, your butt. We run into a problem with the delegate thing. Uh huh. Yes, if there's nobody to the, delegate to, then what do you do? Right. Well, there is actually a very simple answer. Mm-hmm. Okay, you discard it. Oh, why? Well, I mean, he, why would you discard a task that you would normally delegate to somebody else if you had somebody else to delegate it to? Well, first of all, if you are delegating a task, it is. You saying that this task is not worth my time. Right. Okay. It is not worthy of my personal time and attention. And of course, you have basically said that by classifying this as a low importance task. Right. Okay. Low, now, obviously, the, the difference between a low importance, low urgency task and a low importance, high urgency task mm-hmm. is only a matter of the date on the calendar. Sure. Okay. Let's let's say, for example, that you are supposed to um, I, I, I'm trying to think of an example of a low importance, low urgency task. Sharpen all your pencils. Sharpen all your pencils. Fine. <laughs> OK. Um, now, if you were to add to that by tomorrow, uh-huh. that doesn't change the importance of the task. Right. It does change. The urgency. Correct. Okay. If you were willing to go with without sharpened pencils, okay, because that's what you say. When I say, when this is a low urgency, low importance task, it is something that I'm willing to deal with the consequences of not having done. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is eventually you're going to reach for a pencil and it will not be sharpened. And before you can write anything down, You'll have to walk all the way to the pencil sharpener and stick it in there. and You, you know, right? Okay. Right. But you're willing to cope with that. Mm-hmm. Why are you any less willing to cope with the consequences of that task not being done just because the deadline is approaching? Okay. Right? I, I see virtue. what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? It's like this distinction between... you. So you have low importance tasks, mm-hmm. but then you have... But this distinction where, well, these ones aren't important, but they're due tomorrow. Suddenly that makes them worthy of sh- even shoving off on someone else. You know, why is a low importance task worthier just because it expires tomorrow? So, I, you're, argu- totally- so you're arguing that the urgency uh, in some degrees dictates the importance. What, what, no, my argument is if a task is of low importance, and you are willing to discard any low importance, low urgency task, 
there's no reason you would not be willing to also discard any low importance, high urgency task, especially because any low importance, low urgency task is eventually going to become a high urgency task as whatever deadline approaches approaches. Mm -hmm. So if you do not have someone to delegate to, Uh then instead anything that is low importance is a discard. Yeah, I'm, I'm with or, you. Okay. Or what you need to do. So so you break your tasks down. You have the do box. You have your des- decide box. And now you're left with these delegate and discards. Right? So discard the discards. Fine. Now look at your delegate box. Go through each task in the delegate box and ask yourself, am I willing to live with the consequences of not be- this not being done? If the answer is yes, discard it. It goes in the discard. If the answer is no, you have misclassified the importance of the task. Gotcha. And I would even say that to the point where you're delegating tasks, like if you're, so you have these low importance tasks that have to get done tomorrow, but they're not important. So they're essentially when you're, they're not important enough for you to do, right? For you to do personally. They're not worthy of your time. Mm Mm-hmm. Why would they be worthy of your subordinates time? Because I could certainly have my subordinates start working on one of the high importance tasks, maybe one of the high importance, low urgency tasks so that, you know, if they screw up or if they prove they can't be trusted with the task, there is still plenty of time for me to come in on it later. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The idea of delegating low importance tasks seems to me to be giving out busy work. Mm. I would ask myself why I'm even paying a subordinate to do things that I'm myself am willing to discard, you know? Now I realize that some of that is a matter of as soon as you have the resources, then obviously the equation changes and some things you were willing to discard because you just don't have enough time, you can actually get done and it will make your life easier to have them done. Right. You know? And that's where the spectrum thing, you know, where it becomes important to, you know, to say it's not just high importance. It's an eight out of 10 mm-hmm. or it's not just, it's not, lo- I mean, it's low importance, but it's a four out of 10, which since I have two assistants in my office and nothing to give them to do, the four out of tens will make my life easier. The one out of tens, I'm not even going to waste their time. Right. But the point, like, I, I have this real problem with when you classify anything as low importance that you are willing to live with the consequences of it not being done, I think you should dump it. Yeah, if you're a one-man operation, I think so, too. I think if you're a hundred-man operation, even if, you, even if you have a hundred people working for you, you still have limited resources. Right. Because you only have a hundred people. So if you need a hundred and one man days of work in a day, you don't have it. Something's going to have to be gone without. Sure. Okay. So if you can prioritize your tasks in, in order of importance. So this is, okay. This is where I really think the problem falls is this idea of just putting these things on a quadrant is it's conflating two different things. Okay. Number one, the importance of the task should be used to determine whether the task gets done or not. Because obviously that's what importance means. Important means it needs to be done. Unimportant means the consequences of not doing it are not bad enough to make it worth the resources. You know what I mean? Sure. Like you can make that, that cost benefit. It's like the consequences of not doing it are not so bad that you can't live without it. You know, or the benefit you get from doing it isn't big enough to really make it worth it. Okay. So once you have your tasks organized in order of importance, whatever the minute you need to decide, now you need to look at that list and whatever the minimum level of importance is below which you can live without it, that's where you draw your line and say, okay, everything below this line is just discarded. You know, I have 10 tasks that have to get done in a week. So if I can put them on a scale from one to 10 in order of importance, you know, just importance that I absolutely cannot survive if this one does not get done. 
If this one does not get done, no one will even notice. You know, that's my 10 and my one. And then put everything else somewhere on that spectrum between the two. Okay. Then I can look at the amount of time I have and say, okay, everything below a three done. I'm not doing it. Sure. It's not worth it. After that, then you can now take these tasks and sort them in the matter of urgency. Like, okay. The number nine task is going to expire today, whereas the number 10 task will expire on Wednesday, right? So now I know which one to do today and which one can get done tomorrow and so on and so forth. So now there you have your do, do, decide, and delegate based on where the urgency for the tasks fall and where the importance falls. But you have to do a culling first. You shouldn't be setting the priority on anything you have decided is unimportant. Okay. Okay. And, this, and also I'm, here's the thing though. All right. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to make a distinction here. All right. Okay. If you have at your disposal, a hundred people, you can afford to go down on that list further. Sure. Okay. That's, that's my point about that. But okay. we also, I, I think we've, we've drifted from, you know, some people with various little side projects that they want to deal with and that kind of stuff into how business should work. Uh, I'm going to quote Star Trek First Contact here and say you imply a disparity where none exists. Um, I think I, I think there is one here because what we're, what we're we're not talking we're not we're not doing you know big business advice here. What we're doing is we're we're just setting based on our based on what will have been or should have been the smart goal discussion. Mm-hmm. We're just here prioritizing what we're going to put into that smart goal thing. Okay, you know. But you don't think that the way an individual decides, because for like, whether you're a business or an individual, your time has value. Yes, absolutely. It does have value, but we're not. And it is the most limited resource you have. Sure. But we are not, <laughs> you and I sitting here on this podcast are not giving business advice. I don't think there's a difference between business advice and life advice. Okay. Well, Mr. Accountant, I I don't know what to do with you then. (laughs) (laughs) Well, look, it's, it's a distinction between in terms of setting priorities and building goals. Is there a difference between publishing a book and losing 50 pounds? You mean you mean other than the steps that you would it would take to accomplish? Well, those yeah, things. obviously the details of the project, right. but in terms of how you would make the decisions as to breaking down the goal into appropriate steps and putting a deadline on each one, you know, t- t- the basically measurable, actionable, mm-hmm. yada yada yada, mm-hmm. all of those things. Is there a dis- dis- difference between how you would do that? Uh, yes, there is. On the grounds that one, you are doing essentially for yourself and the other you are doing for other people. Really? I think so. <laughs> Cause I gotta tell you, I made a profit off this book. Uh-huh. I I did it to make a profit and to see my name in print. Sure. But you I mean I I can say there was this noble pursuit that I love gaming and want to bring people into gaming. Okay. Right. Um it, but I don't think the motivations actually matter that much. Uh, I think think you're still going to set the goals the same way. And I think if you're honest with yourself, you should. I mean, look at it this way. If I didn't find uh, like even the whole bringing people into gaming, that's still a personal reward. That's something that I personally feel is a rewarding thing to do. I don't know why, because I don't believe in a gaming community, but (laughs) you know, I, cause I could have stayed an accountant and I could have made money as an accountant and would, would have done things different way. But so in the end we could say, yes, I, I made the, all these business decisions for other people, but it was still because I thought that was the most rewarding way for me to fulfill the goals I have. And that's fine. But your, your losing weight, whatever example. Okay is almost entirely about you and other people are not as involved in that goal and the accomplishment of that goal as publishing the book involves other people being involved in that, you know, in, in, in the end product, I guess is where I'm going. Okay. 
Sure. Now, but the danger now, but like, look at your postcard project. Mm -hmm. That amuses me. And I can, and if I decide I'm bored, done. What? That amuses me. And, and if I decide I'm bored with it, then it's done. You know, it's not, it's not priority for me. It's, it's interesting and it's amusing. So it's, it's, you know, that's okay. I would say it's, it's low importance and low urgency. So if it, if it comes to either that or, um, I don't know, making a thousand bucks doing, a uh, an edit job, then, then it gets discarded until the edit job's done. Sure. You know, but that's not, that's not what I'm saying though. I mean, well, obviously part of that is what I'm saying is that you're not, you're not making that decision any differently than a business would, you know, um, because uh, clearly you're willing to choose the money over that project. You know, that, that project is getting you something different. Sure. You know, it doesn't matter what the reward is. It doesn't matter what the motivation is. And in the meanwhile, well, since you wait a minute, deci- wait, 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 no. What do you mean? It doesn't matter what the reward is. It doesn't matter what the reward is. Sure it does. All that matters is you decided it's rewarding. Mm. I mean, if we're talking about setting priorities of importance, what is it that determines the importance of something? I think we have wandered into a minefield here. Are you afraid of it? I think, (laughs) no, I think what we have done here is we have wandered into a discussion that does not fit the amount of time we have to have it in. Okay. And I, I think that's, that's fair enough to say. And I think that we have wandered afield from the basics of prioritizing. I don't think we have. I think we've identified a major point of discussion Mm -hmm. that really needs to be had. Sure. If, if we are going to be in the business of giving life advice, but we are not to people, (laughs) except we are. Yeah, we're not. Okay. I mean, we have accepted that role. That's it. We've decided to do it. The minute we started telling Mm -hmm. people how to set their goals, we have decided, okay, this is something we feel we're qualified to do. Uh Uh-huh. Well, now, now we've run into a point of major conflict here Mm -hmm. where the question is, how do you decide what is important in your life? Mm -hmm. And do you, you know, and what are the different angles from which you look at that question? Like from a business standpoint, from a personal standpoint, from the people who. That's our time.